to RPV City Talk. RPV City Talk is brought to you by the City of Rancho Palos Verdes to inform the community on recent city matters. RPV City Talk is a weekly show that features the RPV Mayor, City Council, or City Employees. Hi everyone, I'm Liz Brown Swanson and welcome to RPV City Talk. It is great to be here with our first City Talk of 2016 and we're going to be doing these programs from the City Council Chambers. Very exciting. This is where all the decisions happen, and I'm with the mayor of Rancho Palos Verdes, Mayor Ken Dida. This is our first show together with you as mayor, and it's great to be here with you. <laughs> it's my pleasure. So how's Thank it going? You. You've been sworn into mayor December, but this is not your first time. You are one of our founders, and we're glad to have you back as mayor. How's it going? It's going quite well. Uh, I'm learning a lot of new things because it's a lot different. Uh, the council meetings back then were far more open. We didn't have the Brown Act. And the Brown Act, in my opinion, is, to a degree, is being overinterpreted in some cases, which is causing the council meetings to be a bit more sterile than I'm used to. But uh, I'm getting accustomed to it. I'm learning the process, and we're moving forward quite nicely. Of course, you've only been mayor now for about six weeks or so and anything that comes up that you're pretty excited that's already happened since you were sworn in? Yeah, a couple of things happened that I think are good. Uh, I've had trouble getting caught up on things that were in process before, but uh, one of the big things that's going on right now, and it's a great concern to the community, is the crime statistics. And the council has been taking some very positive steps to do that. Uh, we're filling in the gaps. We expect uh, Captain Blolin to come back and give us an integrated plan uh, that would provide all the pieces working together. And that's a good thing. Uh, the other thing that was interesting and, and very important, and we just did that this past uh, meeting, was the total proliferation that's happening with uh, cell phone antennas. Wireless communication has gotten just a, almost overloading everybody. Uh, unfortunately, the state and the federal government have made a lot of re regulations that force us to fit within that. So we've worked very hard and we just passed an urgency ordinance that I think is very good. It's going to touch on all the issues that concern the people. So we've done that, so and that, that's a good thing. Now, since we're talking now about that urgency ordinance, it's regarding these installations that are going in the public right of way? And, yes. And just sort of having control over how that all happens? That's correct. Right now, uh, we've had very little control of what's happening. We've put a lot more constraints on it. There's gonna be a lot more resident input to make sure it uh, doesn't destroy the the kind of city we created, uh, so that's good. Uh, it's one of the tougher ones. Uh, we're very happy with uh, our city attorney, uh, the group that put that together, that was great. The uh, final ordinance is gonna come up very shortly because we don't wanna live with the urgency ordinance and it's gonna have some minor changes uh, which are expected, but for the most part, the urgency ordinance really covered the field quite well. Well, I think I overheard someone at the council meeting uh, that you just addressed this at, saying this could actually be a model nationwide on how to deal with what's going on, with how to control these in your community so they're not a blight. And also, you've worked with the citizens quite well to get input. I mean, this is an example of when the community and the residents are upset about something, you're going to listen and address it. Well, we're fortunate in our community. We have experts just about in every kind of technology you would want. So whenever the council is faced with, with a technology problem, we have no problem with the citizens coming forward and giving us the benefit of their knowledge. And you'd be surprised how helpful that can be because when you listen to the uh, wireless community, uh, they're gonna sell you what they want to. and. The council is an expert, but we're so fortunate we got experts in the community. Right. We all want to be connected, though. We live in this high-tech oh, yes. society, and uh, we want to be able to log on. And the, the, being on the Hill, it is tricky with getting keep, keeping connected. 
Well, yeah, but there, there's a right way to do it, and then there's the sloppy way, and we just don't want the You're sloppy gonna way. You're going to clean it up. We want to clean the system. You know, when we started about just sort of the key issues being addressed right now, let's go back to the, this whole situation with what's going on with crime and certainly the perception of safety in the community. I think, Captain Bolin, at your meeting in, uh, in the last five years, we've seen an uptick in burglary uh, go up by more than 50%. So, you know, and neighborhood after neighborhood is coming out now and saying it's happening everywhere in our neighborhoods where it didn't. Um, and so talk about specifically kind of what happened at the last council meeting where you had a draft crime prevention, like a strategic plan. Like what kinds of things are you looking at to help curb what's going on with the burglaries specifically? Well, we're in increasing uh, the burglary apprehension team. They're acting very nicely. We're putting in some trackers on GPS uh, trackers. GPS trackers, uh, with the court approval. It's not going to be arbitrary. Uh, basically, to track suspected vehicles, uh, end up preventing rather than doing it after the fact. The uh, we're looking at cameras, uh, the uh, license plate recognition system. Uh, some special deputies, that sort of thing we're doing as an interim measure while we look at an integrated process to really improve everything. The problem is that the felons that have been released were released because according to the records they were not as serious felons as those that were retained. Unfortunately, uh, the record doesn't reflect what they really are because many of them plea bargain a lower felony to avoid a trial. But really, their crimes are the upper felony crimes, and so they're perpetrating those again as they get free in the community. And they found Rancho Palos Verdes, and they're finding it, is it are we an easy um, community to come into? and? wreak havoc because that's what feels like is happening. Well, it's not only Rancho Palos Verdes. Pevia States has its share of problems, Rolling Hills. I think it's everywhere, but they're gravitating to where they perceive they can have the greatest benefit financially. And so there's a reputation, somewhat deserved, that the peninsula is the place to go. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is that they, they are no longer acting as independent. Uh, my information is that they ha are creating organizations where they pool their resources and they actually have attorneys on retainer now. So it's become organized rather than just sporadic. Right. And this city council is completely committed to oh, yes. stepping it up. I mean, you've already uh, put another quarter million dollars for these two new dedicated patrol cars. Uh, that are just servicing Rancho Palos Verdes, and I don't know when we'll figure out like just how those how effective those cars are being. I think it's going to take a little time. They've only been out on the road for a well, bit, it, but you know you're stepping it up. Yep. Well, if you heard in the council meeting, we also talked about what can we do to improve the volunteer group. Uh, volunteers on patrol. Uh, volunteers on patrol. Uh, you know, having that kind of visibility is a great deterrent. Uh, if they see patrol cars running around, uh, they're not going to take the chance. It's when there is a void in that kind of patrolling that they, they react. So uh, I'd like to encourage people who feel they would want to contribute and help with their public safety to, to volunteer. They will get trained, they'll get uniforms, they'll have cars, they'll have places they can go, and they'll be doing a great service to the community. Uh, because they have the one tool that burglars hate, and that's a radio. There you go. And also, is what the things that burglars hate are things like alarm systems, loud dogs, surveillance cameras, all of that. And to see that you know these that we have neighborhood watches in place, and that it's going to take that effort of everybody sort of looking out for each other. When you see you know you see something, say something. Those kinds of rules. We need to get more involved and active and and. Uh, take action when we see something. If you see somebody driving around your neighborhood that you don't think belong there, call it in. Yes. People sometimes are reluctant to do that, but that's actually why our Sheriff's Department is there. For that purpose, they welcome it. The other thing we need to get people to understand is to harden the site. The burglar will go to the easy site, not the hard one. Lock your doors. 
close your garage door. Don't leave it open. So many people leave their garage doors open all day long. Uh, don't leave valuables in your car. There was a time when the volunteers would go around and put a sticker in your window. And if you had it locked up and nothing in there, you get a little, congratulations, you've just saved yourself from a burglary. If they had it open, say, you might have just been burglarized because your door was open and you got your cell phone on the seat. It's a reminder to people to be more cautious. We don't live in the same kind of environment that we did maybe 20 years ago. It's different. We have to recognize that. One other thing is, but we're going to the next subject is too, in terms of things that you can do. Things like too, like do not leave your trash cans out if you're gonna be away. That's a signal. I had a friend that recently had this happen. They were hit their house, but they'd gone off for a few days and they left their trash cans out. Yep. Someone noticed a car was paying attention to their home, but you can task Edco. They will, for a nominal fee, put your trash back. Yep. You know, so you can, there's definitely ways and like you say, volunteers on patrol will come check out your property if you're on vacation and they, they're watching for those kinds of opportunities. The best thing to do when you're on vacation is make sure your neighbors know you're gone and how long and where and ask one of your neighbors to pick up your mail and your newspapers so that the, it's not there for the prospective burglar to notice that you're not home. Right. And uh, the neighbors can help each other. We, you know, we've got, I come from New Jersey. We didn't have quite as many fences as we do here in California. We've got to overcome those fences. Mm -hmm. As we wrap it up, anything else you want residents to know just to show that this council is on it and working with Captain Bolin and the team out there to help make things safe and turn those numbers around? Yes, I think if, if we, we continue the direction we're going in now, we will be able to turn those numbers around, but we need the help of the residents. They've got to harden the site. Okay. Uh, the last council meeting, a uh, big issue that came up was zone one of the landslide moratorium. Can you talk about, for anybody that turned on the council meeting at that moment when you're discussing, which was a code amendment to allow some development within zone one of the landslide moratorium area. So with all that being said, just what was the issue before you and how did the council handle it? Well, zone one is part of a, a total landslide moratorium area. Uh, which is based on competent geology. Now, when I say competent geology, that doesn't mean that you know precisely exactly what the situation is. Nothing, perfection isn't for this life. So what we did is we said, okay, since we don't know every spot on the peninsula exactly what the conditions are, the subsurface, we said, where we can find something, let's put a safety factor. Unfortunately, in one case, uh, the Monk's case, the judge ruled since we couldn't define one exactly, how could we put it at 1.5? And from a legal point of view, that's probably correct. So as a result, we're forced to go ahead and allow development under certain conditions. So what the city has done is worked very hard to identify those conditions that we could actually determine and apply so that we can ensure safety. The other thing is we want to be sure that the people know that uh, they are building there and that we, since we can't assure them of that extra safety factor, they must understand that they are at risk. The city is not saying, hey, it's perfectly safe, go ahead. Uh, so they're being apprised of all of that. Uh, in the issue before us, there were two properties. Uh, they wanted to develop their large properties. One property uh, indicated they're not gonna wanna subdivide. And so we made some concessions because of the size of the property. And because in some instances in the rest of Portuguese Bend, there were similar circumstances. So we went beyond the 4,000 square foot limit mm -hmm. to 8,000. We did make one restriction. 8,000 is the cumulative number of square feet, not just for the main house and ancillary structures could be more. So we did limit it to that extent. Uh, there's some question about trails on one part. That's got to be resolved. Uh, we haven't got that done yet. We're going to have to work with the owner. And, but I think it will be resolved because it, it's something that we both want. It's just a matter of where and how. Okay. 
So with that, we've approved the fact that they can both put a dwelling on the property. It's a property right. right. They can go forward. And those two property owners, was one was Jim York, and the other was the former Los Angeles mayor, yeah. uh, Dick Reardon. Dick so Reardon, they were right. both here. And, uh, yes. So do you get, is your gut instinct when they left here, they were, were happy with the result of what you all decided? <laughs> I don't <laughs> That's know. That's your personal take, I guess. Was just I, I, I wouldn't say they were happy, but I think they accepted it and understood why. And that's more important. You, you don't try to make people feel bad or happy. Right. You come to a decision, and the most important thing that the council needs to project is we come to this decision based on these facts, and this is why. Once people know why, they're more willing to accept the decision than just have it thrown at them. Okay. So the next step in that, they're going to still come back to you with... Oh, they're, they're going to have to come back with a lot of little elements. Gonna, they haven't cited a building yet, so right. they're going to so have to come back and do all of process. that. Yeah. What they've gotten basically is the encouragement to go ahead and do the rest of the process. Up to now, it's sort of been, I can't even do the process. Well, we said, no, the process is there. Here are the bounds to it. Go forward and we'll look at it. All right. Uh, another to topic that's come up was your at the beginning of the, the month, your first council meeting, you discussed what's going on with Hawthorne Boulevard, and we've heard a lot of talk about what is a traffic signal synchronization project. How about sharing with the residents sort of a little background about the project and what's going on with this whole uh, deal? In my understanding, having watched the council meetings and being involved with it to some extent, this whole thing happened about five years ago uh, because there was a grant available in order to do that. So a lot of accident statistics were used to come up with a justification for going forward with it. That was five years ago. Over time, when that was looked at, there had to be certain things done, trenching to put in the cabling, the fiber optic cabling. And it became apparent that, gee, while we're there, maybe we can also improve communication between Hess Park, Ryan Park, and the City Hall. And so that kind of made sense. And that would be with the fiber optic cable. Now, the, that was the fiber optic cable that was not only going to do the signal controlling, but was going to piggyback other cables in the same conduit. Uh, to improve communications. And that sounded like a good idea. And that went forward. Uh, the problem is I see it, it was piecemeal together based on what the staff at that time saw as some advantages to the city. One of the initiatives I'm trying to get before the uh, city and the uh, Oversight Committee, uh, ad hoc committee of the City Council is going to be discussed in detail at our next meeting uh, to take a look at how we go out with requests for proposals. This one was unclear and as a result we were asked to deny all because one element was left out. Our staff is a very good staff. They're expert in a lot of areas but they don't have the total experience of what the private industries do because they deal it day to day. The staff is there, in my view, to take a look at and validate what's being presented, but allow the private sector to use its best effort to make a proposal to the city. Since we specify specifically what was done, you saw the one of the bidders, the low bidder, come in and say, hey, you forgot the cables, but we'll put them in at no extra cost. Mm -hmm. That really isn't fair to the others because they should be given the opportunity to do the same. Okay, So we reject it and it's going to go out for a bid again. Uh, Just that portion is going out to bid or the entire project? So the entire project to include that portion. It's going to be the total package now. Uh, as Councilman Dehovic looked at it, and I did, the cost of the extra cabling to put in for the cost savings that are supposed to come about, it'll take between 10 and 13 years to realize those 
savings, okay? My view is technology is changing fast enough, maybe we shouldn't do that. Now, the question arises, are we going to do both projects or are we going to do one or the other? If we take a look at it's a combined project, then yeah, the trenching is, asso is associated with the uh, Hawthorne Boulevard traffic signalization, so to piggyback the cable is no cost. Suppose, just suppose, that the justification for signalization isn't as valid as it was, and the council should decide that it doesn't. Now the trenching becomes part of the cost of the fiber optics for mm -hmm. communication. That increases the cost. Does that make sense? The council did a very good thing, in my opinion. They turned this over to the IMAC committee, in, in the Infrastructure Management Committee. They're going to look at those issues. They're going to have the time to get the necessary expert input, come back to us with their recommendations. And that's going to be a big benefit for the council to be able to make a decision of how we go. Okay, so stay tuned for that one. Stay tuned. That, <laughs> that one's not over yet. Okay. Well, one that continues to go on, I want to move on to a lot of conversation happening in the community about the um, sunsetting storm drain user fee. And uh, I just want your take on where, where are we in the process with that in terms of, of that fee? My take on it is we don't have enough information to make a fully informed decision. And let me tell you why. I have asked for a record of what specific projects were used that were appropriate and charged against the user fee, which is a restricted fund. What has happened is general fund money was thrown into the same pot, commingled, and a lot of projects were done that were not necessarily the intention of the original storm drain user fee tax, okay? Which that was passed 10 years that ago. That was passed 10 years ago, and over time... And specifically to earmark, to for storm drain related projects, water quality well, storm drain. No, careful on the water quality. This is what happened. The storm drain user fee project, when it went forward to the public, mm -hmm. they were in told that this is going to be used to fix the deteriorating storm drains. Keyword, deteriorating, okay? When the ordinance was written, it was water quality and flood control. And as a result, they've commingled things like Simon Ramon Canyon and other things in that and commingled the money. And so now what I'm trying to find out is how to get that split apart to find out specifically what money was used to do the remedial work on storm drains, not San Ramon Canyon, not flood control, and see what money was spent on that. Is there any money left? Uh, what are the prior? There was a list of priorities of what storm drains needed to be repaired. Were they done? Are there new ones? Until we really know that, we can't just go forward and tax the people, and I'm not willing to tax the people unless it's really necessary, and I don't see it at this point. Right. So the council going forward that will decide whether to put that out to the, to the ballot. That's going to come up on February 2nd, and it'll be a council decision. That's an important meeting, too. A very important meeting uh, for the council to decide whether on the limited information they have, to go forward and ask the people to tax themselves again. Because you can call it a fee, it's three letters, but to convert those three letters to TAX instead of FEE, they're the same thing. Mm -hmm. And on average, what does it cost? A, if the fee is applied to those that are hooked up to the system, right? Is that how that works also? And Yeah, right? uh, I don't recall the exact number, right. but it was something on the order of $86 a year or okay. something in that, on that order. It isn't large, but and I've always, Every dollar matters. I've always been told if you watch the pennies, the dollars will take care of themselves. So I'm going to watch the pennies. We only have a few minutes left, and uh, we're going to be having you here every month. I just, you know, as we wrap it up in the next few minutes, some of your priorities as mayor over the next, you know, this year in 2016, just sort of your priorities, the council's priorities. I know you've got lots of ideas. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I've got a lot, and it's going to take me a while to accomplish all of them, uh, although I know a lot of people would like to see it happen overnight. It's not going to. Public safety right now is by far the most important thing as far as I'm concerned. People need to feel safe and comfortable in their homes. Uh, we're seeing the kind of uh, problem with public safety that we shouldn't have to endure, period. That's number one. Number two, and this has been something you're aware of and a lot of people are, my priority is Portuguese Ben Slide. We have been treating the symptoms since 1983 when the first proposal was made to try and address the causes. And as a result, we have spent an average over that time of about a million and a half dollars a year in treating the symptoms and not the cause. We know the cause. There are those who want to know the cause to the nth degree. That will never happen. The only way that'll happen with wells is if you make Swiss cheese out of the area, and that's, that's counterproductive. We need to start moving forward and take some measured steps on the things we know that are causing the problem. And as we do, the problem will lessen. It'll uncover other opportunities, and we can take those. And in time, we're not going to stop the slide. This is what people, or you can't stop the slide. We're not going to. We're going to control it. And I've got a good example. Abalone Cove in 1968 was moving several feet a year. We've controlled it to the point it moves less than an inch a year. Wouldn't it be great if the Portuguese bent slide were only moving an inch a year instead of nine to 20 feet, depending on the rainy season of then El Nino coming? Who knows what the motion is going to be this time? We need to start addressing the cause and start dealing with the problem. People are concerned about funding. Funding is going to be available from a lot of areas who want to see ecology. They want to see things preserved. We've got uh, an ecosystem that's being destroyed in the ocean due to the erosion of the cliffs. All of that is happening. There are people who are interested in preserving that. And their help in, to preserve that means we control the slide. So I think we have an opportunity. I think we need to do a whole show on this and then another show on this. Well, yeah, we can. <laughs> yes. I'd be happy to do a whole show on that and bring some people in who are competent geologists and competent civil engineers who are interested in solving the problem and not making it just another outdoor laboratory. Because that's my, my opinion. That's what it's been for a long time, and we need to change that. All right. Well, we're going to have you back here next month to talk about this and all the other issues happening. Mayor Ken Dada, thank you for being back on board, and, and, and uh, we appreciate all your service. And uh, that's going to do it for this edition of RPV City Talk. I'm Liz Brown-Swanson. Thanks for joining us. See you next time.